Let's pick back up and start by talking about student FAFSA information. The student will be required to enter various pieces of information on the FAFSA. That information will include confirming their identity and contact information, agreeing and consenting for the federal tax information transfer from the IRS, information about their marital status. The FAFSA will also ask about their college plans. It will also ask if there are any personal or unusual circumstances that the student needs to share. One of the most important things that the FAFSA does besides collecting financial information is to determine a student's dependency status. The FAFSA asks questions to determine the student's dependency status for Title IV financial aid purposes and to determine what funds the student may be eligible for. The student will be asked a series of questions that will help the FAFSA determine if they are a dependent student or an independent student. If the student answers no to all of the questions regarding dependency status, the student is a dependent student and will be prompted to invite the parent as a contributor. If the student answers yes, to any of the dependency questions and that information is verified, the student will become an independent student. There is an option for students to apply for only direct unsubsidized loans when they are in a situation where their parents are unwilling to provide consent or FAFSA information. Sometimes, the FAFSA doesn't tell the whole story. Sometimes, students encounter some unusual circumstances. These unusual circumstances may consist of conditions that justify an institution making an adjustment to the student's dependency status. Financial aid administrators refer to this as a dependency override. Examples of a dependency override may include conditions in which the student is unable to contact a parent or where contact poses a risk to the student. For example, parental estrangement or abandonment, abuse, incarceration, or fear of an unsafe environment. In these situations, the student will not provide parental information on the FAFSA and will be considered provisionally independent. An estimated student aid index, or SAI, will be calculated, but the student will need to follow the school's process for verifying the dependency determination. If the school determines that the student does not meet the eligibility criteria for the dependency override, the student will either only be eligible for a direct unsubsidized loan or will need to provide parent information on the FAFSA. A dependency override simply cannot be done because the parents refuse or do not want to consent to submit FAFSA data. A student's dependent or independent status is not determined based on who is going to pay for the student's education, but represents a student's living and family situation. After the student submits their personal information, the student will be requested to provide the parent's name, date of birth, and social security number to invite the parent to the FAFSA. The parent will receive an email inviting them to complete their section of the student's FAFSA. In this email, the parent will be referred to as a contributor. 
Now, we get a lot of questions about who is the parent or guardian to be labeled as the contributor and required to submit information for a student's FAFSA. Typically, the contributor for a dependent student includes the student's legal parents, which can be a biological parent or an adoptive parent. Grandparents, foster parents, and legal guardians are not considered parents for the purpose of completing the FAFSA unless they have legally adopted the student. If a student's biological or adoptive parents are divorced or separated, the student would include the parent who provides the greater portion of the student's financial support, even if the student does not live with that parent. This is a change from previous FAFSAs. If the parent who provides the greatest amount of financial support is remarried, the step-parent would also be included in the financial information. It is important to note that an additional change with the 24-25 FAFSA is that the parent who pays child support is considered providing that support for the student and that the parent who receives the child support will now claim these dollars as an asset, not as support provided. These changes will potentially result in a student listing a different parent as the parent of record as compared to previous year's FAFSAs. The student information that will be collected in addition to their initial information submitted on marital status and college plans includes demographic information, citizenship status, and parents' educational history. It will also ask whether their parents are associated with any of the armed forces or have been killed in the line of duty. The FAFSA will also ask the student for information on their current high school if they are still enrolled or information regarding their high school graduation. The FAFSA will attempt to determine the student's citizenship status or whether the student is an eligible non-citizen by how they answer these questions. Eligible non-citizens include U.S. permanent resin residents and persons of the freely associated states, which include the federal states of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau. An eligible non-citizen status may also include students with refugee status, victims of human trafficking, persons granted asylum, and other specific qualifying factors as indicated by the Social Security Administration and the Department of Homeland Security. When the federal processing system processes the FAFSA data, it verifies the students meets the citizenship or eligible non-citizen criterion, but it does not verify the citizenship status of the parents. Parents do not need to be U.S. citizens or eligible non-citizens for their students to be eligible for federal student aid. Therefore, parent citizenship information is not collected on the FAFSA. The FAFSA will require the student to enter in or consent to the transfer of their federal tax information. If the federal tax information can be transferred from the IRS, the student will be asked minimal questions regarding their financial information. If federal tax information is not available to be transferred, the student will have to manually report this information on the FAFSA. We are commonly asked about what asset information needs to be included. For the student or parents, examples of assets are cash, 
savings, and checking accounts, and the balance that the student or parent has in these accounts at the time of FAFSA submission. The net worth of businesses and investment farms. The net worth of investments, including real estate, but excluding your primary resident. Remember, not all of the asset information will apply to dependent students. The next section of the FAFSA is going to address the student's plans for college and collect information on the specific colleges or universities the student is looking at. The student may list up to 20 colleges that they would like their FAFSA information sent to on the online FAFSA form. The student will need to provide the federal school code, which is a six digit code for each college or university. If the federal school code is unknown, it may be located using the search feature within the online FAFSA or by searching on that college or university's website. Financial aid departments at your colleges or universities oftentimes will put their federal school code front and center on their financial aid web pages. Finally, the student is going to be asked to do a review of information. It is important that the student reviews the accuracy of the information to try to mitigate the chances that additional information may be requested by their chosen school. After the information has been reviewed, the student will simply sign and submit. This will complete the student section of the FAFSA. Once the student signs and submits their FAFSA information, the FAFSA will then send an invite to their identified contributors, asking for them to log in and initiate their process. We are going to take another moment to pause here. This completes the discussion on the student portion of the FAFSA. Next, we will move on to a discussion on the parent information needed to complete the FAFSA.